On this week's episode of Exhibitionists, we are spotlighting Mavericks, artists who are forging their own path. We'll meet the fashion designer determined to bring diversity to the runway with a dash of glitter. We'll meet the team behind a groundbreaking version of the King Arthur story. We head to Nunavut to hear from the dynamic artist merging Celtic music and throat singing. We'll party with performers on Slut Island, and we'll see the world through the eyes of one b-boy. Hello and welcome to CBC Arts Exhibitionists, your weekly journey through the Canadian art scene. I'm your host, Amanda Paris. At Toronto Fashion Week, when most runways were filled with ball gowns and wedding dresses, designer Haley Elsacer left her mark with sportswear and sparkles. From a young age, she's always stood out with her bold and unconventional style. And now she's translated that look to the runway. Lily Singh, Katy Perry, and Miley Cyrus have all worn her clothes but her fashion show was special for other reasons. Here she is to tell you more. When I was a teenager, I was super shy. So I used fashion as a way to kind of show my personality without having to speak. If people didn't know my name, they knew I was like the crazy girl that wore the colorful stuff. My aunt ran into someone I went to high school with and they're like, I can't believe that little punk girl is like a fashion designer now. My name is Haley Elsacer and I'm a fashion designer. I always have some sort of muse or characters in mind when I do each collection. This collection that we just showed at Toronto Fashion Week is called Teenage Wasteland. I kind of imagine the kids from Freaks and Geeks, that TV show, if they moved to the desert and started a country club. They're really over the top prints, there's flip phone prints, there's dice, cigarettes, and then the, the styling was really over the top too, so we had these crazy nails, the sparkly hair, the kind of oil slick makeup look, and then the Nikes that were really futuristic and fun. So the idea of Teenage Wasteland and these kind of rebellious teens is definitely really drawing upon my upbringing and my teenage years. I love the idea of putting that notion of like my earlier years on the runway in a really concrete way. When you're a teenager, it can be really hard to want to be yourself. Sometimes it feels like you're wrong for being yourself. For me, fashion that I really got into was looking up to more of like musicians and people that had really interesting fashion. People like Karen O are really probably why I'm a designer. When I was 15, I moved to Australia for a year. That's where I learned how to sew. So that's when I really started making my own stuff. It kind of opened up my world because back in the day, we didn't really have online shopping. I'm from a small town. So I was very limited to what I could buy and like the style that I could wear. So I did a lot of thrifting, but this allowed me to kind of envision the outfits that I wanted to wear and make them a reality. My choice of model is always very, very important to me. I felt really limited to what the agencies had to offer um, in terms of just everything, size, looks of models, diversity, so I, a few years ago, I went to the street and got street casted models. Growing up, I always felt like I didn't quite fit into the typical fashion industry, and that is just because in the industry, there's this beauty ideal that has been established so many years ago and it hasn't changed. It's crazy to me that the beauty is found in one really tiny set of measurements. It's actually so easy to do samples in different sizes, and that's an excuse that needs to end. I find so much beauty in the differences that people have. I love when people wear my clothing and kind of bring it to life with their own style. This time around, I want to say it's probably the, one of the most diverse shows that I've done. I don't want someone to think I couldn't wear that. I want them to be like, oh, that person looks like me and they look awesome, I could wear that. I love the feeling of people feeling included and involved. I think that it's just super important to really figure out who you are and don't be afraid to show that and really embrace it. And like I've made a career off of being a crazy fashion obsessed weirdo. So just really embrace who you are and kind of run with it. Don't try to hide who you are. The animation and video game worlds are heavily male dominated industries. But our exhibitionist in residence this week is one woman who has been creating fantastical landscapes in both. 
I'll be sharing some of Paloma Dawkins' work throughout the episode, and you'll see that she revels in psychedelic patterns, planets full of colors, and off-ball characters kind of like her. You'll understand what I mean when you meet her. She sent me a video intro that <laughs> I just love, and I think you will too. Take it away, Paloma. The story of King Arthur and his Knights of the Round Table has been told a million times over on the page, stage, and screen. But the key to this version's unique spin is the distinct perspective of the players and a creative friendship that opened the door to a mystical and personal retelling of this classic tale. Nyla, what's your favorite part of collaborating with Marcus? <laughs> Sometimes. <laughs> Good answer. So my name is Marcus Youssef. I'm the artistic director of New World Theater for King Arthur. I'm a uh, co-writer with Nile, and I'm also playing Merlin. We're in the uh, Berkeley Street Theater in, here in Toronto, uh, getting ready for our premiere. We're right this very second in the middle of technical rehearsals, which you love, right, Nile? All the waiting around and... <laughs> yeah, exactly. King Arthur's Night is about Camelot, the kingdom of Camelot. It's about, actually, it's about the, the Grail how to find a grail. And who gets to control the kingdom. We've been co-writing this play for quite a few years. Marcus and I are pretty close friends. And we figured out a way to work, to, to write together. It involves us hanging out, jamming, uh, improvising, talking about the story, and I record everything. And then out of those recordings and those transcriptions, uh, I assemble and organize a script that I then we then work on together. After we finish the script, we all cast and say, wow, I think we can do it. I love working with Niall because I find he's really, really good at a certain kind of creative thinking that I aspire to be good at. Enough, leave me. Having an integrated cast is uh, one of the most exciting uh, experiences I've had as an artist. Now it's a professional actor, but our cast is never, the, the rest of our folks who live with Downs, who are in the show, um, have never done a show before. What they are doing on stage and doing in the show now, I literally, when we started teaching classes that they were in, would have told you that it was impossible for them to be doing the things that they're doing. The first meaningful moment in the play for me is Niall and uh, Tiffany, who plays Guinevere. It's sort of a structured improvisation, and they just talk to each other about what it means to be a king and a queen together. And it's pretty much the same all the time, but also changes based on just whatever they're thinking or feeling at the moment. And I find one of the most beautiful um, uh, present scenes I've ever watched uh, uh, on, on stage. I also really hope that people walk away going, oh, that's what like an integrated company looks like. It's not about who people are in their real lives. It's about people doing work and making this wild show. And it's also not just about shows. It's about what happens when we truly make things together, no matter what we are doing. There are enormous benefits to all of us that this isn't a favor anybody's doing anybody. This is about making the whole thing better. Okay, so up next we have this Celtic uh, throat singing musician. Oh, I really like that one. And then we have this cool piece where like, you, you, you kind of live as a break dancer and then you, you, you sing through their eyes and, and then you just get to like do the break dance. You really wish you had a GoPro on your head right now, don't you? A little bit. For people of mixed heritage, like me, 
It can get complicated trying to navigate your ancestry. Sometimes it feels like you have to pick a side. For Kathleen Merritt, art became a way for her to creatively merge her two cultures and celebrate her complicated identity. Take a look. Kathleen is a member of the Kathleen is a member of the Kathleen. I never thought that I was going to be a throat singer, and I don't think my parents did either. My father is originally from Sydney Mines, Nova Scotia, and Cape Breton, and my mother, Southampton Island in Coral Harbour. My dad came up north as a bay boy, so he worked for the Hudson Bay Company. So every summer when we were kids growing up, we went to Cape Breton. I always remember driving to my grandparents' house in a van, listening to like the Rankin family or Rita McNeil. We knew that where we came from was very different than Southern Canada. Growing up, I never really identified as anything. You're not Inuk enough to be an Inuk, but not Kablunak or white enough to survive in the South. Where do I fit? When I started working on this project, around the same time, I was reconnecting with my family on the East Coast. I wanted to blend together sounds from both my Inuit and Irish heritage. That Celtic influence sound in, in with throat singing and a little bit of spoken word. This album is is about celebrating identity and celebrating culture and, and life. Uh, it's named after my late Atiq. So right on the album cover, you'll see it says Iva Loakjuk, which is my Inuktitut name. It's said that when we're named after somebody in our culture, uh, we often take on the traits of that person. She survived throat cancer twice. It's funny that I became a throat singer. So it was really important for me to include her strength in the, in the project, but also the combination of sounds between the North and, and the East Coast. And throat singing for me was like a way of reclaiming my own cultural identity. And, and even now, like when I meet a new throat singer, I'm like, let's sing. One song imitating the environment, a friendly competition arises. Revitalizing the Inuit culture, we will sing. Kataja, Rhodes, Kayapa, the love song. I think growing up in the north, but not being a full Inuk, but also the young Inuit today, not knowing the history of, of our culture, kind of a bit of like an identity crisis amongst young people until they begin to learn about their own history and who they are. Throat singing, traditional tattooing, drum dancing, all of those kind of cultural practices were looked down upon by the missionaries and the church and government even. And so all these practices were almost lost. Once you start to explore your own family background, you, you get a strong sense of who you are. At least for me, that played a strong role in terms of being a proud, young, you know, Irish person. <laughs> yeah. And it just came out in the music, naturally. Have you ever wondered what it would be like to see the world while doing a windmill? That's an everyday experience for a break dancer. It's all part of our new segment where we spend an entire day in an artist's shoes and see the world through their eyes. Check it out.
Good seeing you, man. Good seeing you, bro. Yes. See you. See you someday. Wasn't that like you're like here and then you're doing this and then you're spinner? Mm -hmm. Okay. Anyways, <laughs> the next up is April Aliermo's piece. Oh yeah. Oh, I love her stuff. She always takes us to so many good places. Okay, roll camera, please. Three, two. For years, feminists have worked hard to reclaim words that historically have been used to insult and disempower them. The word slut is one of them. Many women are attempting to deflate the power and meaning behind the word and use it as a tool of subversion and resistance. Among them are the organizers of Slut Island, an annual arts and music festival in Montreal. Let's go check it out. You know, because it can get slutty up in there. You know, we got real slutty tonight. <laughs> In the last few years, a lot of attention has been brought to the extreme lack of diverse representation in summer music festivals across North America. And I heard about Splat Island recently, and the name just sounded so cool and different that I wanted to check it out. So we're on our way to Montreal to Slut Island to get the lowdown on what's going on. We want to create a uh, like platform for femme, queer, like BIPOC artists and kind of like stay away from like that the mainstream kind of festival, like how it's just completely dominated by mostly like cis white men. This is our fourth edition, and um, it's kind of expanded a lot with each year. It allows for space for people to grow and experiment and feel comfortable. It allows for space for other people to show their creativity. When you see trans people that are free, that are like completely independent, that are like in control of their own narratives, and it doesn't matter who you are, it doesn't matter if you're cis, it doesn't matter if you're straight, in the end, it's gonna help you feel more free within yourself. Come on, make some for yourself. It's really exciting to be in a, in like a space and a show that's very intentionally curated for people like me. I think it's really important to have a multitude of voices speaking about different experiences and Slut Island is a platform for those different stories to exist. And so my album, which explores my Chinese Catholic heritage, like that is a story that people can relate to. And it's really nice to be taking back the word slut. I don't even actually talk that often about why it's called Slut Island, but I mean, I do really stick by the word slut. It's definitely like a word that was used against me. It feels really good to, yeah, have a festival where that word just feels good to say again and again. The reason Sam and I do Slut Island is because it's crucial to the music scene, at least in Montreal, and I think everywhere else. <laughs> the musicians I saw were so inspiring and I was left feeling very empowered. I've been to tons of music festivals, but not a single one like this that was so thoughtfully curated with many voices represented. We got real slutty tonight, it was amazing. <laughs> it was amazing. Thank you for joining me on this wild adventure of Canadian art. Let me know what you thought of the show. Send me a message on Twitter or Facebook. Our handle is at CBC Arts. I love hearing from you. I'll be back again next week with even more incredible artists from Blythe to Yellowknife. 
Until then, keep creating and innovating. Peace. Awesome show. Thanks. Way to go. What is that? It's like my new virtual reality camera, like the, the through the eyes, guys. It's like, it'll show people my POV point of view, right? Because I know, I know see, it has, you can, I think people would like to see what it's like to live as a senior producer for exhibitionists. Okay. Yeah, so do something really Amanda-y, like you're looking. Okay, can you try to do something a bit more Amanda? Okay, now really pump up the Amanda-esque-ness. Okay, ready? One, two, three, go. Awesome, we got it, we got it.